Um, okay, I want to welcome everybody to Estate Planning 101. Um, to those watching now, uh, and as well as those who um, will watch it later, because this is being recorded. So um, also want to uh, then introduce who is going to be speaking. Um, there's going to be Ann Stacy. Ann is with uh, Von Briesen and Roper. Uh, she's a member of the St. Raphael's and the Finance Council, and she focuses her practice on uh, estate planning and uh, business and corporate law. Uh, we also have Tom Moniz, who is also with Von Briesen and Roper. Um, he uh, also focuses on estate planning and business law. Um, and then yours truly, Peter Van Hollingen. Uh, I'm a lawyer with uh, Corporate Legal Counsel Limited, uh, also a member of St. Raphael's and, uh, and the Finance Council. Uh, also focusing on uh, corporate and business law and uh, state planning as well. I uh, do want to do a mention that uh, Anne and I are uh, proud graduates of uh, Notre Dame Law School, that fine Catholic institution. Uh, and we've uh, allowed Tom to join us uh, being also from that other Catholic university uh, just down the road a little ways. So uh, uh, welcome to Tom and Anne. So if you have any questions um, there, you can't do it uh, uh, by voice, but you can um, type in your question in the chat box and then we will attempt to try to answer those. So um, there we go. So the agenda for the, uh, our seminar here is um, uh, those listed. What is estate planning? Why do we do it? Who needs it? Uh, the essential uh, tools. We'll talk about uh, probate a little bit, uh, then the wills versus trusts and the uh, other ancillary documents, uh, the powers of attorney. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit about the tax law, the SECURE Act, and so on. So I welcome now Tom to uh, start us off. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, and and uh, Peter won't say the name, but I'll say Marquette University as a, a proud alum. So as, as the other fine Catholic institution. Um, but I, I, as Peter and Ann know, I, I'm a, a great Notre Dame football fan. So I, I, I'll just put that plug in there as well. Um, good to be with you all tonight. Uh, when, when we talk about estate planning, uh, sometimes it's helpful to just to talk about what is an estate. I, I think in our line of practice, we throw around terms like estate planning all the time and, and uh, you know, not, not everyone understands what, what that means and what we're dealing with exactly. And so when we talk about your estate and planning for your estate, we're really talking about everything that, that you have and that kind of comprises your life. That might be financial accounts, cash, investments, retirement accounts, um, your real estate, your home, uh, recreational property, uh, tangible property, uh, antiques, collectibles, heirlooms, uh, automobiles, you name it. Uh, the, the list goes on and on. And the concept is all of these things, big and small, uh, valuable and non-valuable, they all comprise your estate in some form or function. And so uh, when we talk about estate planning, we, we talk about planning for all these various types of assets and, and how that fits in with your and your family's overall plan. So with, with that being said, what is estate planning? I, I guess I like to distill it down into two main principles. One, I think of estate planning as planning that we do to protect your assets and your family, uh, and also ensuring that your assets and your resources are used by the people you want to use them and in the manner you want them used. So there's a component of transitioning property to people you identify, um, but also a component of setting up how those assets or how property uh, will be used, uh, both now and into the future. So why do we do estate planning? I, I think a lot of times, there's a little bit of a misnomer that estate planning is, is really only death planning and, and that 
uh, you need to make a decision about who inherits your property when you die. And, and while that's certainly true, it's certainly an important component of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, there's a lot of other components that fall under the estate planning umbrella. Uh, it really think of it in terms of lifetime planning and then uh, death related planning. And so what I mean by lifetime planning is planning for, for instance, events of incapacity. Um, that could be temporary or, or permanent incapacity, uh, medical incapacity. Um, we also can deal with asset protection. You know, uh, there's ways uh, and strategies to protect assets both during life and after, after you pass away. Um, in addition to that, we often have lifetime gifting components of estate planning, and that can be both uh, small, you know, small annual gifts to, to grandkids or to your children um, or, or giving for educational purposes or things like that. Uh, that can also be large scale gifting as part of a, an estate tax uh, reduction scheme or, or part of uh, longer term asset protection or estate tax planning. Um, and so uh, in addition to that, uh, I've got at the bottom there succession plan. And so what I mean by that is that that really ties into uh, folks that own businesses or have family businesses. And the, the succession planning for those businesses is ultimately uh, tied to each individual's estate plan. And for a, a closely held family business, it's hard to separate the, the business succession plan from the personal estate plan. So a lot of what we talk about uh, during lifetime estate planning deals with uh, the immediate plan for the business and, and, and how the successful transition of that business enterprise might unfold. Uh, then when we move to death focused planning, uh, certainly that, that's a, a, a main component of what we're dealing with when we do a state plan. And so a lot of the topics that we're going to uncover tonight and, and that are topics that, that, that you all have probably thought about is what is probate? What, what does that mean? Uh, we'll talk about ways to avoid that probate process after you pass away. Um, estate planning for after death, we, we again can do some asset protection, uh, not only during life, but also post death. Um, the estate plan will help control who receives your assets after you pass away. So it sets up a plan to, uh, to be implemented after you pass away. Um, a, a well thought out and executed estate plan is also going to help to the extent possible minimize taxes, minimize fees, and, and try and minimize expenses. Um, and then finally, what we're dealing with is making this transition easier on your family and your friends. You know, when, when there's a death, that's a traumatic event, uh, no matter what. And a well thought out estate plan will hopefully uh, remove some of that stress associated with someone's death and, and knowing that there's a well thought out plan uh, to, to help with the next steps. Uh, so it, th this here is uh, kind, kind of a dated look, looking graphic, but I, I've liked it for a number of years. I, I just think it's a helpful graphic representation of, of what we're really talking about tonight. And the, the concept is I often describe uh, your will or your trust, your estate plan as a funnel. And, and, and what you work with your estate planning attorney on is figuring out how to direct your various assets and the, the things that you care about into that funnel in a way that it ultimately moves the assets for your children or your next generation or, or whoever uh, you want to pass assets to. And to the extent we can, we want to try and turn off those spigots on the side of the funnel, uh, one showing for taxes and one showing for probate. Um, taxes can't always be avoided 100% uh, of the time, but we can try and minimize them. And uh, same with probate, to the extent that we can uh, avoid that process, uh, sometimes that's a, a beneficial thing to do. So be before we get going, uh, it's helpful to think about who needs estate planning. I, I think there's some misnomers here too, and that people tend to think, well, you know, I, I, I don't have kids or, you know, I don't have much in the way of assets, so I don't, I don't need to do an estate plan or you know, I, I'm not retired, so I don't need to do an estate plan. But really, the short answer is that everyone needs estate planning. Um, now, estate planning isn't one size fits all. Everyone doesn't need the same 
type of estate plan or the same complexities, uh, but, but everyone from uh, college aged adults on up to uh, retired folks and even people that are, are close to death uh, could benefit from various types of estate planning. I will say though that especially folks that have children or own a home or perhaps own a business uh, or, or if you're retired or of an elderly age or if, if you've got a second marriage or dealing with a, a divorce or a blended family, these are the type of factors that that I think really highlight the importance of, of doing estate planning. Uh, but again, the, the short answer is everyone needs it. Um, it it's just a, 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 to, to what degree is kind of the, the issue. Um, and the, you know, I guess this, this little comic here, um, you know, there's not a lot of humor to be found in the estate planning world, but uh, we, we do have a couple of comics that we can scrounge out every once in a while. Uh, this one here shows uh, Mr. Frosty uh, timing uh, time to talk about estate planning and it, it's March. So the concept here is it's, it's you, know, you wanna do it before it's too late. Um, here, Frosty, it turns out had another month uh, since we had a nice snowstorm in April here this year. So, uh, but in any event, the, you get the concept. Um, so what, what I think we, we're going to focus a lot of our discussion on tonight is really around what, what we consider to be the 10 essential legal documents or, or, or groupings of documents uh, that, are, that comprise the typical estate plan. And so that's going to include uh, the will, and, and we're going to unpack these things, but the will, the revocable trust is a very common estate planning tool, financial and healthcare power of attorney documents. These are documents where you appoint uh, people to be able to make decisions for you in the event you're not able to make decisions for yourself. Um, a living will, uh, HIPAA authorizations. These are medical related documents that we'll talk about. Um, funeral and burial directives to give some directive about how your, your funeral and burial uh, uh, preferences will be carried out after death. We'll talk about marital property agreements, which is an important concept in Wisconsin. We'll also talk about planning with tangible personal property statements. And then uh, finally, the importance of beneficiary forms. We all have accounts and assets that have beneficiaries. These could be life insurance policies, retirement accounts, bank accounts, and uh, coordinating those beneficiaries with your overall estate plan is an important piece that, that we don't wanna overlook as part of the estate plan. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Anne, who's going to start talking about uh, and, and unpacking the specifics of some of these core planning documents. Anne? So like, like Tom mentioned, um, the first of these 10 essential legal documents that we'll be discussing is the will. And the, the will is basically just a formal letter that you write to the probate court that directs the transfer of your assets on your death. Um, you also use a will to appoint personal representatives, which is the person who is in charge of administering your assets on your death. And if you have minor children, you use the will to appoint guardians for your children. Um, and an, an important thing to note about using a will as your core estate planning document is that um, wills will subject you to going through the probate process. So probate, um, when we talk about probate, what does that mean? In a nutshell, probate is just the court administered process of distributing a decedent's assets to those who are entitled to receive them. And avoiding probate is a central estate planning goal for many people. And the reason that so many people try to avoid going through this probate process are for these three big reasons, the time costs, the lack of privacy, and then the, the financial costs. So on the time um, expenditure side of things, um, the time cost can be heavy. A typical probate lasts between six months and two years. Um, and if, you know, it can last much longer if you have complicated assets that you're dealing with, or if you have family members who are fighting. Um, for privacy, um, once a will is filed with the probate court, it becomes a public document. So there's a lack of privacy there. Anyone can see who you've decided to give which assets of yours to. 
And then the costs, um, the average probate cost between three to 7% of the value of a decedent's estate. And those costs are made up of attorney's fees, court costs, filing fees, notice publication costs, um, and those can really add up. What happens if you die without a will? Um, if, you, if you die without a will, basically the state will make a will for you. So the court will um, appoint a personal representative who will be in charge of administering your state. If you have minor children, the court will appoint guardians for your children. And then state law has these default rules for who will receive your assets on your death. And this um, complicated table here, the table of consanguinity, is just a visual representation of how the state will administer your assets on your death if you die without a will. And the, um, the crux of it is, without going too deep into it, is that the state assumes you want to give your assets to your closest family members that are living. So if you have a spouse, uh, all of your assets will go to your spouse. If you don't have a spouse, then your assets are distributed among your living issue, your children and your grandchildren. If you don't have any living issue, then you jump over to the next column of this table and your assets are distributed to your parents if they're living, if they're not living, then to your brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, and so on. So this, for a lot of people, these default rules can achieve your dispositive intent, um, but for many people, it, it doesn't achieve what they want. It doesn't take into account any charitable giving you might wanna be involved in, um, giving your assets to non-family members, and so on. So it's important to make sure that you, you take action and make sure your estate plan um, distributes your assets how you would want them to and, and don't leave it up to the state. And here, Peter will jump into talking about trusts. Okay, um, now we're gonna talk about, uh, and I'm sure many of you have heard of a revocable living trust. Um, a, um, uh, as opposed to, they, a trust can either be revocable or irrevocable irrevocable and we'll focus on the revocable it's uh it's been often called the uh cornerstone of an estate planning um a lot of estate plans if uh, you want to do more than just the will um you start with that revocable living trust uh, uh, people have asked okay just what is a trust a trust is is essentially a very old concept it goes back to the uh the roman times uh civil law you essentially are creating a legal person by contract. And the parties to that contract are in a revocable living trust are the same person. Uh, it could be the one who creates it, uh, the, uh, the beneficiaries of it, uh, the, uh, the trustees of the trust. Um, so uh, that's uh, in a nutshell what, uh, what a trust is. Um, so the main benefit for um, uh, today uh, with the, uh, and we'll get a little bit into the tax side of things. Uh, the main benefits for a trust is avoiding probate. And the reason is uh, what, what a person is doing and you avoid it by putting title to your property into the trust instead of um, uh, a non-trust. So then you end up having to go to probate, have a, a court determine um, who should have something. Uh, or the assets. So um, you're avoiding probate. Uh, the other main uh, benefit of a trust is um, it's not public, it's private. So if people are concerned about, okay, the value of their assets and uh, who has access, and Anne has mentioned, uh, once a will is probated, it's in the court, it's public. So that's the other main benefit. So, um, uh, Generally, with a, uh, if, if a trust is created by husband and wife, uh, there is not much to do and, uh, after the first death. Uh, um, if, as most people, hold uh, assets in joint, uh, there is really nothing, just like a joint bank account. You, um, the surviving spouse essentially has title or owns that asset. So, um, so in the trust, generally you appoint successor trustees and successor trustees then once at the second death will uh, administer that trust and 
and look at it and determine um, um, where the assets go, following the direction of the, the people that created the trust. So um, some additional benefits to the uh, trust um, is uh, on the next slide. It, uh, there's, again, it's private. Um, it, um, you avoid probate. Um, there are other things you can include in the trust, um, you know, a supplemental uh, trust or, uh, and, and essentially you control everything. Uh, the IRS, as far as they're concerned, on a living trust, um, it's because it's totally revocable, you can void it at any time, um, they see it as a non-entity. It just, uh, it's just as if the, the, uh, the, spouse, the people who created the trust still own everything. So you have full control. Um, one benefit that uh, I've always found as well is if you have assets in multiple states, um, and avoiding probate, then you avoid ancillary probate in those other states. So you save money um, at for that. The what I found with clients, the the only negative with a trust is there's more cost upfront. Uh, generally, putting trusts together um, does cost more. There's more lawyer time. Um, so, uh, but. Uh, generally on probate, the, the cost is at the other end. And generally that is more cost. So um, that as far as uh, Ann and Tom, if there are any other uh, benefits that you um, think of other than those listed, um, because some of these you can also do with a will. Um, but generally a trust is a great vehicle, at least as a, uh, uh, as a starting point in estate planning. So on the next slide is the, um, uh, the personal statements. Now this can be done, and I've used them both with wills and with trusts, is just a statement um, because oftentimes uh, people who create trusts or wills, they want certain heirlooms or certain specific assets to go to certain people in their family. And, and these need not be, you need not amend either the trust or the will to do these. So the way I've put them together is just um, a, a list of specific gifts. You identify um, the relationship, who the recipient is, um, you date them, and then you sign them and, and change them if you want. So that's um, essentially on those specific uh, statements. So, uh, and next, I think we're back to Tom. I'm going to switch us over from um, discussing that the, the death side of estate planning. So how, how to distribute assets, what vehicles we use to distribute assets on death to now the, the life side side of estate planning, which deals with planning for incapacity. Um, and a lot of this planning relates to your making healthcare um, decisions and, and medical decisions for you if you're living but unable to make those decisions for yourself. So the first of these documents is the healthcare power of attorney, um, which is a document you use to appoint an agent who can stand in your shoes and make medical decisions for you if you're determined to be incompetent. Um, so your healthcare agent would you know, make decisions as to what treatments you might receive or undergo, um, if you need to move to a nursing home, those sorts of things. Another document is the living will. That's a, um, a document you use to indicate to your physicians that in the event um, of a terminal condition or a persistent vegetative state or coma, you either do or do not wish to have life-sustaining procedures used. The HIPAA authorization is another document that's designed to deal with these really stringent um, healthcare privacy laws, which prevent disclosure um, for medical workers from disclosing medical details about a person, even to a person's healthcare agents or trustees. So this HIPAA authorization pre prevents this problem by allowing your um, medical professionals to discuss your the state of your capacity with your with your agents and trustees. 
Um, burial directives are a form which allows you to appoint agents to make decisions um, about your, your burial and your funeral services, and then to leave specific instructions for your agents to carry out. Um, and then finally on Medicaid planning, and Medicaid planning could be an entire presentation in itself, but uh, we just touch on it here because it often goes hand in hand with some of this um, planning related to incapacity. And the takeaway um, we're just touching on is that Medicaid planning is, is really complicated, but if it's done correctly, it, it can work to preserve your assets while also maintaining your eligibility for any benefits that you're entitled to. Um, another of these 10 essential documents that we're going through is the financial power of attorney. Um, similar to the healthcare power of attorney, a durable financial power of attorney is used to appoint an agent, but in this case, that agent um, can take financial actions for you and make financial decisions on your behalf if you become incapacitated. The difference between a financial power of attorney and healthcare power of attorney is that the healthcare power of attorney, um, there the agent, your healthcare agent's authority is only triggered by the principal's incapacity. So the principal has to become incapacitated for your healthcare agents to have a decision-making authority. Um, for your financial power of attorney, those are often designed so that um, your financial agents have immediate authority to act for you. And the rationale behind that is to allow your agents, your financial agents to assist you if you need assistance right away rather than having to wait for a formal declaration of, of incapacity, which oftentimes takes one or two physicians to go through and can take a while. I think this is my slide here. Um, and before I get into this example, I would just uh, echo that last comment that Ann was making about financial power of attorneys and when they become effective. And, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, between husband and wife, they typically are appointing each other as their primary agent under these documents. And, and sometimes that financial power of attorney is, is to set up uh, as a matter of convenience. And so um, even if there's not the potential for health incapacity or anything like that, one spouse might just be traveling or, or unavailable and the other spouse uh, could sign on their behalf for a, a document or uh, deposit a check or, or something like that. So it provides a, a level of convenience between spouses in particular. Um, so w one example that, that I sort of had the unfortunate uh, experience of dealing with with an actual client uh, kind of illustrates the, the potential downside, which can become catastrophic pretty quickly uh, when you don't have some of this relatively simple planning in place. Uh, here, the situation that happened was I, I had a client that reached out to me and they had a, an, an elderly sister of theirs who had a variety of health issues over her life, uh, diabetes, uh, some other health issues. And the the issue was that they progressively got more serious and debilitating as, as she was aging. And prior in her life, she had been married and her husband had passed away and had left her a, a, a decent sizable inheritance inside a trust of which she was the beneficiary. So she had access to money. And uh, as she was becoming more and more incapacitated and, and not willing to take care of herself, uh, emotionally or physically, her brothers and sisters contacted me because they wanted to do something about it. They, they wanted to help. She wasn't taking her medication. Uh, she, she wasn't doing the things she needed to do to, to take care of herself. She had never, unfortunately, uh, executed a, a power of attorney. She had not appointed the people that she wanted to uh, help make decisions for her in the event that something like that happened. And so the result was that her siblings were left with one option, and that was to petition the court to ask the court to declare their sister incompetent, and so that the court would appoint a guardian for the sister to start making healthcare decisions and decisions about where she would reside and, and, and how she would be cared for. Um, the real unfortunate thing is that, that that can become a really 
ugly process. Uh, a, a guardian ad litem is appointed uh, for the individual. The individual can also have the right to have their own legal counsel, in, in which case this, this person did. And then we were representing the family petitioning for the guardianship. And so now you have uh, three attorneys involved in this, this sort of sad proceeding where, where siblings are trying to prove and demonstrate their sister's incompetence. Um, and as we all know, that, that slide into incompetence is not always black and white. And so certainly the, the sister here was aware of, of the dynamics of what were transpiring. And it was just a, an, an ugly, sad thing to watch unfold. Uh, what was really sad and, and uh, just sort of difficult to see is that we were ultimately successful in petitioning uh, to get a guardian appointed, which was good so that the brothers and sisters could start taking care of their sister. The downside was that the way that the law works in Wisconsin is that if the person who uh, is, is uh, challenging the petition, so in this case, the, the incapacitated sister, if they have financial resources of their own, and they're ultimately not successful in challenging the petition, they had to pay for the fees, not only for their own attorney, but for the petitioner's attorney's fees, our attorney's fees, and for the guardian ad litem. And, and this was unique because she had access to, to significant money from uh, the trust of which she was a beneficiary, but she ended up having to pay close to $30,000 in fees. This was relatively contested. There was an appeal. Is quite ugly. And so uh, it's just a, a sort of extreme example of how the family dynamics get sort of torn apart. It, it was it costly in terms of money uh, and relationships, and it, it could have been avoided largely with doing some lifetime plan. So um, next, I, I just wanted to, to note uh, briefly about Wisconsin and Wisconsin's marital property laws. A lot of us have, have probably heard about how Wisconsin is a marital property state. And uh, what that means is that generally between a husband and a wife, the, the presumption is that the assets of the husband and the wife are, are assets of the marriage. They're marital property, meaning they belong equally to, the, to, to each of the spouses. And uh, what this, this I, I won't get into all the nuances of Wisconsin's marital property law, other than to say that it, it is a nuanced and complex set of statutes that apply to spouses and the property rights between spouses in Wisconsin. And so because of that, it underscores the importance in Wisconsin of needing a marital property agreement as a component of your estate plan. Um, Sometimes I think there's some hesitation to this concept. I think people view that concept through the lens of a prenup uh, or a prenuptial agreement. Uh, while that is one type of marital property agreement, that's not always what we're talking about here. Uh, a lot of times marital property agreements don't deal at all with the concept of divorce or, or the potential for, for divorce, but rather deal with the classification of property uh, between spouses while they're married for tax beneficial reasons and other, uh, other rationales that make this very important planning. The last piece that I'll leave you with uh, on the bottom right of that slide there, it talks about a Washington will, and that's, that's not a typo. What that refers to is a concept in Wisconsin law uh, that, that's a statutory concept that was pioneered by the state of Washington uh, once upon a time. And so it's, it's kind of retained uh, this, this concept of a Washington will clause, but it's language that Wisconsin statutes allow a married couple to put into their marital property agreement that has the effect of saying any property that would otherwise be subject to probate for that couple, meaning property that didn't get directed to their trust, for instance, uh, and it would be otherwise subject to probate, can be distributed according to the, the trust and it can avoid probate. So uh, this helps, for instance, with property that, that uh, your house, for instance, maybe it's not titled in the name of your trust, you pass away, the house is titled in your individual name. If you have this Washington will clause in your marital property agreement, it allows your trustees and your family to get that house pulled into your trust, even after you've died and to save and avoid the probate related expenses and, and uh, processes. 
Uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Peter to talk a little bit okay. about uh, some, some estate tax updates. Yeah, we'll talk. Um, this is where, at least on the, the first part, the estate gift and uh, GSC tax, um, it's, uh, you know, where you know, people eyes glaze over and you're talking about exemptions and exclusions and, uh, and anyway, on the, and then uh, Tom will talk, pick it up on the SECURE Act and so on. But um, uh, on the exemptions today, um, the, each person has a lifetime exemption uh, up to $11.7 million, okay? That, and trusts at one time were, uh, were a great vehicle to get uh, to maintain uh, both uh, exemptions for husband and wife. So uh, if, if the married couple had over 23 million, there was a way using um, a trust vehicle with an irrevocable trust that would uh, take over and then you could have both exemptions. Um, there was a time uh, and I looked uh, back um, 1997, that uh, lifetime exemption was 600,000. Um, as recent as 2001, that was 675,000. So if, if your estate is double that, uh, trusts were definitely used to uh, at least um, use both uh, exemptions. So, um, and, and today, as I mentioned, is 11.7. Uh, but it, uh, it will sunset in, I believe, 2025. So which, what will happen then? Maybe it'll go back again. Maybe uh, the 11.7 million will, um, will be much less. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, it, whether or not today, um, if you want to look at a trust every uh, five years or so, um, um, using a trust for tax purposes is uh, really only affects people, probably the top 1% um, uh, of the people in the U.S. who have estates over, what, 25 million or so. Um, as far as the 15,000 annual exclusion, each person um, can give as many $15,000 gifts to as many uh, people as you want and uh, without having to file a gift tax. And again, if you, if you gift away more than 15,000, then of course you file the gift tax and that will count toward your lifetime uh, exemptions. So, um, and now as far as the gift tax, it's the same um, as far as the, uh, the lifetime uh, uh, exemptions and that will also likely uh, be going down. Uh, probably with when this sunsets or even maybe changes before then. I know Biden is talking about making changes uh, in the uh, uh, estate and gift tax, so it may already happen before. Um, as far as the generation skipping tax, uh, that uh, it's a restriction. What that is, it uh, um, it's the government's way of restricting gifting. Um, to grandchildren is, is the main thing and thereby avoiding an estate tax to the next generation. So um, it's these kinds of things that often help if you're uh, uh, consulting with a lawyer, uh, then you can get more in depth and then they'll, uh, depending on your own circumstances, how big your estate is, will determine whether or not you want to include um, uh, the different kinds of trusts in within the uh, uh, living trust. So uh, with that, um, I will turn it over to uh, Tom to talk about the SECURE Act. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And, uh, you know, before I do, you mentioned the, the annual exclusion, the $15,000 gifting amount. And uh, Peter and Ann, I, I don't know about you guys, I, I tend to run into a lot of clients that have a bit of a misconception about how that works. And, and I think sometimes they hear that $15,000 rule and think that they can't give more than that. And if they do, it's going to cause the person that receives that gift to have to pay a tax, um, which, which of course isn't the case. The recipient of that gift won't have to pay a tax on it. But as, as Peter mentioned, if you give more than 15,000, it means you have to report it on a gift tax return and it eventually uses up your, your lifetime exemption. 
And so I, I just bring that up. If, if you are listening and you happen to be uh, a, a younger person that maybe receives those annual $15,000 gifts from your grandparents and, and they tell you that their hands are tied, they can't give you more. Well, nonsense, they can. Um, if you happen to be a, a grandparent that's making those gifts and you wanna just still tell them that it can't be done, well, don't tell them what I told you tonight and you can just keep letting the, uh, that, that be your story. So uh, in terms of the SECURE Act, this is now uh, a, a couple years old, but at the end of 2019, Congress uh, relatively quietly, I might add, passed what's known as the SECURE Act. And the, the SECURE Act is really important uh, for a couple of reasons and for, for most of us. So it's almost everyone that has retirement accounts that are tax deferred. So uh, traditional IRAs, 401k accounts, things of that nature. And one of the primary benefits of those accounts, as we all know, is that they allow tax deferred growth of those assets, uh, meaning those accounts continue to grow and they're invested and you don't pay tax until the money is withdrawn and ultimately used. If you die and you have money in a 401k or an IRA, under the old law, uh, the, the beneficiaries that inherited those tax deferred accounts could continue to defer the taxes and the withdrawals on those accounts for a period of time based on their age and their life expectancy and some other calculations. But oftentimes that allowed it to be continued to be stretched out and to defer the tax for, for many years, uh, decades, in fact. It was a very uh, tax advantageous thing for the people that own those accounts, but also for the people that inherit those accounts. Under the SECURE Act, that all changed uh, relatively dramatically, I might add. And, and what it did is it imposed essentially a 10 year cap on how long uh, those accounts can be continued before they have to be distributed to the person that inherited them. And so uh, whereas someone might be able to continue to defer distributions uh, and the taxes on an account like that for many years, now that account has to be distributed uh, by the end of that 10 year period. Um, th this is important for, for really uh, two reasons. One, you might have trusts already in which the drafting was done under the old regime. And so the, the language of your trust might not mesh so well with this new language. And under the SECURE Act, that could actually result in a penalized fast forwarded five year minimum uh, or maximum uh, withdrawal period. Uh, in addition to that, uh, if, if you don't do any planning, it could mean that the, the dollars are, are literally forced into the hands of the beneficiaries within that 10-year period of time. It might be worth considering directing those accounts to a trust uh, if there's asset protection concerns or, or other you know, spendthrift concerns for those beneficiaries. Um, finally, it, it, it has brought up different planning opportunities related to whether it might make sense to convert those traditional IRA assets into Roth IRAs. Um, there's charitable planning opportunities here with IRAs. Uh, it, it underscores some of the benefits that can be achieved with using uh, tax deferred accounts to, to accomplish some of your charitable planning goals. There's a lot of, of complexity and nuance to these, these planning techniques, but suffice it to say that if you, if you don't have an estate plan, or if you haven't had it updated in the last couple of years, this new legislation is, is something that, that is uh, frequently needed to be addressed in those, those documents. Um, I, I, I just kind of touched on this, but there's uh, charitable planning opportunities as it relates to your IRAs. Um, particularly, uh, if, you, if you reach age 72, you start dealing with the issue of required minimum distributions from your IRA accounts while you're alive, meaning money that you start have to uh, withdraw from that account. And, and there's a calculation to, turn, to determine the minimum amount you have to take out. Of course, when that happens and you withdraw that money, that generates an income tax, uh, which had been deferred. But once you withdraw the money, the income tax is realized. So a, a lot of times, there's ways to use that money towards your charitable planning goals 
so that uh, you, you can make a qualified contribution of those required minimum distributions directly from your IRA account to a, a qualified charity in a way that can allow you to avoid recognizing that income tax gain and can also serve as a, as a donation to that charity. Uh, this is planning you don't want to undertake without consultation with your CPAs or your attorneys, um, but it's definitely a, a, a planning technique that's available to those that, that maybe don't need the cash from those required minimum distributions, want to, to provide some benefit to charity, and also want to achieve some level of income tax benefit at the same time. Um, that, that's great during life. Also, if you happen to, to pass away with money still in these types of accounts, they become attractive sources of money to fulfill your charitable uh, bequests and giving that you might have in your will or your trust. And so there's, there's language we can put into a trust to direct your trustees to fulfill those types of charitable gifts to the extent possible with these tax deferred assets uh, in a tax efficient manner before we would use uh, other assets that would not be as tax efficient to make those charitable gifts. Anne? Finally, um, this evening, the, the last big topic we're gonna touch on is digital assets. Um, because these days, digital assets can make up a significant part of a person's estate. And really, regardless of the value of your digital assets, they're just like um, your tangible assets and that they'll need to be dealt with and administered upon your death. Um, and this can, this can present issues for people because um, your trustees, your personal representatives, your agents, they need access to your digital property. So they need to know your username, information, your passwords, your personal identification numbers, and all of that to be able to, to administer these assets for you. And they also need to know of the existence of your digital assets. Um, so because these problems were becoming more prevalent, the legislature addressed the, these issues in 2016 by enacting the Wisconsin Digital Property Act. And that act um, allowed people to appoint a fiduciary who has management and, and access um, authority over their digital assets. So those agents can handle those assets upon a decedent's death. Um, so in addition to conferring this authority to your agents over your digital assets, we also recommend that you keep an inventory of your, your digital assets, you know, listing what they are, how to access them, what your username and password information is um, to kind of ease some of this administrative burden. Finally, Peter will wrap us up. Okay, sure. Uh, so what's next? Um, Definitely want to, uh, if, if, you, if you don't have a will or you don't have a trust, definitely consider it. And it really doesn't matter how old you are. Um, it definitely is worth uh, talking with each other uh, between spouses. Um, and then what I generally do, and I'm sure others do as well, if I get a call, then I, I start the process by sending a questionnaire. And that helps, uh, it makes that first meeting with uh, the client much more productive. And at least then we can get a better idea of, hey, is, is a will the best? Is a trust the best? Um, so definitely, um, yeah, and definitely consult an attorney. So, uh, and then funding a trust. We've talked a little bit about um, funding a trust and that's really what makes the trust effective. If you create a trust and don't uh, fund it, in other words, transfer title to it, um, then it will act just as a will because if, if the, the property is still held by the individuals rather than the trust, uh, it may or may not <clears throat> need to be probated. Um, and you also may have heard of other, other things in Wisconsin. There is such a thing as a, a des if you know, be, if be a husband and wife and they know one, uh, want to pass the real estate to their uh, children, uh, there's such things as a designation of the um, uh, TOD on, uh, you know, a beneficiary and avoiding probate that way. So that's definitely an alternative, but that could be discussed when you're meeting with your attorney. Uh, definitely review, um, probably every three to five years, 
uh, look at is, is uh, the trust or the will still the way you want it uh, to be handled. So there we are. Um, uh, we thank you. I, uh, I'm sure if there are questions, um, uh, use the chat box and we'll see what we can do to, to answer any questions. And if not, um, we can definitely uh, um, on the, oh. I think that one's for you, Ann. Um, can you read it, Peter? I, I can't. I read, uh, regarding digital properties, does the POA of a trust have legal access to these accounts? Um, okay. Um, it probably doesn't have anything to do with the trust, but um, I, th I know that um, that Tom and I at Von Griesen, we we make sure that our our trust documents and our financial powers of attorneys both include powers to confer the um, authority over digital assets to the trustee under a trust and then to the financial agent under a durable financial power of attorney. And the, the other thing I'll add to that, and um, you know, just appointing a POA does not necessarily give that person access to your, your various accounts or your digital assets. Um, that's a power that you can choose to grant in that document or not. And it's a discussion you could have with your attorney about whether you think that's appropriate. It also gets to that discussion we had earlier about whether you want that authority to be effective immediately, uh, even if you're uh, of full capacity, or if you only want that person to have that authority if you are incapacitated. And so there's a decision to be made there as well. And so um, if there's a concern about people having access, there, there's things that you can implement uh, to, to that degree. The question about a POA and a, a trust, um, the, the POA is only applicable while you're alive appointing an agent to act for you while you're alive, but, but to act for you. The trust would be handled by the trustee and that would only become applicable upon your death. Um, there's a second question that came in here about what's the general cost of establishing a will and or a trust. Um, I, you know, I, I don't wanna speak uh, for Peter. Um, I, I, this is a, a difficult question because this type of planning can be so personal to each person. And a lot of times that can take on different, different shapes and different functions. Um, so it, I, I will tell you uh, from my perspective, the way that I typically handle this is I typically do this type of planning on a flat fee basis as opposed to an hourly rate. And that's one question we get quite a bit. Um, I also tend to have the initial discussions and, and to to learn about your family and understand what, what type of planning we need uh, without charging a fee or without charging an hourly rate and then providing a fee quote based on that discussion and the scope of the plan that you're looking at uh, before there's any decision to proceed. And so that's typically how I handle that process um, uh, as, as the range can really vary depending on the facts and circumstances. I do wanna add uh, what I found as well is that um, Generally speaking, uh, putting a will together and the ancillary documents, uh, like the powers of attorney and uh, and such, or a trust, it it's generally it ends up being more for a trust. And, and again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you may be paying more for the trust now, but if your overall costs, um, uh, probably at the far end, avoiding. Because when you have a will, you will go through probate. So there will be costs there. So generally I found at the front end, uh, the trust uh, is more than a will, but overall, uh, if you do the will, there's more at the other end, but then uh, you're generally not here to worry about it, <laughs> so. Anyone else? We do have one question in the Q&A. 
Oh, um, is it possible to, to obtain hard copies of the PowerPoint slides? Is that what you're looking at, Karen? Yes. Yep, um, we, can, we can share this PowerPoint and this, the slides with, with the church. Um, and then if you call, you call Deb or the administration office at the church, they can email you a copy of these slides. Okay, with that, we, uh, we thank you um, and um, um, look forward at, I guess, at some time and doing this again. <laughs>